Christoph, one of the things that really fascinate me about trying to understand the brain is that very sophisticated brain scientists have the most diverse thinking in terms of where is the core locus for where the memory occurs, for where the key is. Some people think it, it occurs at the quantum level. Uh, rational people like you and I think it occurs at the, at the neuronal level. Then some people think it, you have to use broad systems in the brain, that there's no real memory in neurons. You have to use millions of neurons even to make one. And then some people involve the social environment, and you have to have this giant gestalt of everything all together before you have meaning. You have these enormous orders of magnitude difference in where the, the, key, the key locus is. Why is that? Well, I'm not going to address the sociological question why that may be. <laughs> Most brain scientists, okay, those one would expect have, should have the right expert knowledge. Most brain scientists would say it's at the synaptic level and at the neuronal population level. So what I mean by that, synapses are the contact points between neurons. And a typical, let's say, nerve cell in your my brain may have 10,000, 20,000, you know, synapses. So it, once again, the brain is very heavily interconnected and the stuff of interconnection is synapses. And ultimately, we think memories are stored in one way or the other, shorter or longer, uh, in the, the strengths of those synaptic connection among the neurons. That's really where our memories of of who I am and my mom and what I had for breakfast and, you know, who Julius Caesar was. We think all of those things are stored somehow in synaptic memories. Okay, so let, let's step back and, and look psychologically at the kinds of memory. People talk about episodic, uh, semantic, procedural. What do these terms mean? In ter it, it, are there really differences in the kind of memory from a brain perspective? Yeah, so this is a realization over the last 100 years. There's not just one form of memory. Memory comes in different kinds, and they can have, they're probably different mechanisms, and they may be located in different parts of the brain. You know, just like on a computer, you've got long-term memory, let's say disk or DVD, and then you've got short-term memory, RAM, and then you've got, um, you know, things directly that are on the, um, 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 you know, very fast type of RAM that are directly um, directly on the on the CPU chip. So even there, we're now developing a hierarchy of different of different memories. Likewise here, so we have a long-term memory. Uh, so long-term memory, essentially, you know, where I was 10 years ago and what I had this morning for breakfast, that's long-term memory. And, and that, that divides into sort of episodic memory, where I was this morning, or um, semantic memory, as I said, you know, what's pi, you know, 3.14152927 and all of that. <laughs> Um, then there is um, uh, working memory. So if you give me um, uh, your phone number and I, you know, take 10 seconds to take out my notebook and write it down, that's working memory. And then there is um, a very short-term memory. If I flash an image on, on your eyes, you'll remember that. And those memories are very different from what trainers call muscle memory. So, for example, the memory for playing, um, you know, for climbing or for learning how to bike or how to, how to tie, you know, how to tie shoelaces, those are different things. And we know those are different because some patients, some famous patient, for instance, may not, uh, may have no memory of the last 10 or 20 years, it's sort of like being actors in a Greek tragedy. They don't remember anything about their personal life after the accident or after the trauma that gave rise to the to the to, um, to the damage in the brain. Yet, for example, they can learn certain things, uh, uh, certain procedures without remembering how they learned them. Mm. It's uh, portrayed very impressively. Do you know the movie Memento? Mm. So it's really shown very well in this uh, in this movie uh, Memento. So there are different forms of memory, and we you can study them. So as, as scientists, if you tell me memory, that's not good enough. You need to tell me what what type of memory it is, and then I can tell you something about where it is and what part of the brain it's it's stored at what level. But what you're saying is that all memory are stored in synapses, but based on the kind of memory it is, it might be stored in different parts of the brain or different brain systems working together. That's correct. Yes. Yes. So how can we then make progress? How do we go to the next step in really trying to integrate a sense of memory into, uh, into learning? Well, you ha we have to, so exp I mean, if you ask me a practical question operationally, we have to focus whatever on one particular form of memory. So let's say I'd like to learn how do people recognize faces. Mm -hmm. So we do that in the lab. So I, I build a computer system that's based upon uh, the way I think the, the visual brain works in monkeys and in humans. And then I showed a new face and then I, it does some sort of neural network learning. And then uh, it it's can learn to recognize, hopefully in the best circumstance, it can learn to recognize that face um, in a new pose. So I may show, you know, 
my face from this profile and then I hope it'll recognize it from here or from here or more difficult from here or from here or like this or like this or like this or like this. So again, you have to focus on one particular um, form of memory and then try to do learning in that particular context. And then when you have the learning, what are the kinds of correlates that you would try to attach to it? So then ultimately what you have to do experimentally because it's difficult to look at the synaptic level. Synapses are small, they're like a, a micrometer, sure. millions of a meter. So, and you have roughly a billion of them in a cubic millimeter. So if you take a little piece of brain tissue, like a grain of rice, you've got a few billion synapses in there. So, and they are three dimensional, they're not unlike a chip, they're not all laid out on a two dimension on a flat plane. So experimentally, it's very difficult to directly access them. So then you have to do many much more crude experiment, let's say where you teach a mouse or you teach a rat to, let's say, to avoid, you train it, you become conditioned, if it steps here, it gets a shock, it gets over there, it doesn't get a shock. So you do some a very simple memory like yeah, that, yeah, yeah. and then you try to look for the, for the correlates, for the synaptic correlates of that sort of memory. But in terms of, of looking for the function in the, uh, the function of the different kinds of memory in terms of the spatial location in the brain of, of, of where it would work in terms of episodic or semantic or procedural or short-term memory or working memory, how, do you, how, how would you proceed to do that? Well, so they don't have... I mean, visual memories tend to be stored in, in the visual brain. So if you, the measure in which you lose your visual brain, you lose vi uh, visual memory. Mm -hmm. It's not just one, like this is one memory chip, like in all the science fiction <laughs> movies, you take out that memory chip and then, the, you know, you've lost all your memory, like in hell at the end of 2001. Mm -hmm. So it is distributed across, but not across the entire brain, but across a relatively large part of the brain. And we still don't understand, let's say, where the memory of this particular conversation we're having, right? So yeah. tomorrow morning, I will have some memory of this. Hopefully. Hopefully. Okay. And if you ask me where exactly is that stored, that's a very difficult question. We can't, I mean, I can tell you what it's going to involve visual memory because of the sites. It's going to involve auditory memory because of obviously we're talking. It's going to involve some high level part of my brain because I know something about you and, you know, I know something about the things we talked about. So that's stored yet at a different part of the brain. Then it all has to be combined in a part of the brain called the hippocampus. So when I when I remember the sight of our conversation, I can also remember the sounds of our conversation. So we know broadly which areas are involved, but how this specific memory is laid down across, you know, thousand or maybe even a million neurons, that we don't really know right now. They're theories, they're mathematical theories using neural networks, but we don't really know to what extent they're, they're, they're really important. And the role of the hippocampus in doing that in terms of formation of this integrated memory? Is to uh, combine the different aspects, audition, sight, sound, etc., smells, etc., and to consolidate. So, for example, if I have tonight at an accident and I lose my hippocampus, mm. Uh, I probably wouldn't remember anything about what happened, uh, you know, about our conversations tomorrow. Mm. So it's necessary to consolidate, to do long-term consolidation, and to bind all the different disparate elements together. Because, I, I mean, that's a remarkable thing of conscious sensation. It all comes together. When I remember something, usually I remember the sound, and maybe if there was a particular smell or, um, you know, the, the different colors, all of that. I remember together as one percept, yet it's strange why that should be so, because we know they're, they go, even the processing, let's say color processing done in a different part of the brain compared to motion, compared to auditory, compared to smell, yet I experience this as one. So somehow the brain has to combine all that disparate information into one unitary experience percept. Okay, so that's ha happening in, in the hippocampus in terms of the consolidation combining it, and correct. combining it. And then what does it do with it? Because it... Well, it probably feeds, it probably takes that information from the different parts of the cortex and feeds back some sort of signal. And that may happen in, 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 in doing dreaming because there's evidence yes. from both human and animal experiments that that's one of the function of, of REM sleep, the, 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 the type of sleep when you dream, when you move your eyes rapidly, that it actually serves to consolidate memories. And so that's probably what happens in hippocampus. It, it binds that information and it takes all the information in from the different cortical area and sends some sort of transformed information back. How exactly that happens, once again, we don't know yet. Amazing. It never ceases to amaze me. Uh, you talk about a, a, a fascinating combination. You talk about how neurons can, can have meaning. Uh, it seems almost impossible for a single neuron to, to be in the same breath with the word meaning. What do you mean by that? <laughs> well, ultimately, What's remarkable about our conscious percept, perception is that it, it's meaningful. When, when you see red here, it's not just an abstract symbol. 
you know, X and when you see, um, you know, black, it's Y. No, when you, when I see black, all sorts of things come to memory, you know, come to mind. When I see red, you know, there's blood and there's ruby red mm -hmm. and there's, you know, red sunset and the red Mars. All those things is implicitly or explicitly there, present. Mm -hmm. And so, in that sense, these things are highly meaningful, let alone they can also be emotional charge, right? With red, you may remember, you know, you may associate anger or something like that. So you have to ask, well, obviously my brain seems to be responsible for doing that, so where, where does the meaning come from? And so the, the speculation, the hypothesis Francis Crick and I advance, and at this stage it's nothing but a hypothesis, is that ultimately the meaning re resides in the fact that the brain learned over both over the brain of its predecessor in the form of its genes, as well as in my own lifetime, it learned to associate red with all these other red things I mentioned. It learned to associate with certain types of emotion. And all of that is represented in forms, again, of these, of these synaptic interconnection that sort of encode the memory of all of that. And so when you have a set of neurons that code for red, that they are active, that actually they give rise to the percept of red, then they will in turn activate, at least at some level, all these mm. synapses. And those synapses as a whole, when you have, so you have red neurons, you have neurons over here that code for blood, and over here you have, you know, little, um, you know, neurons that code for Mao, you know, in his little red book, <laughs> and for the, the flag, the red flag of, of, of China. And so all of those neurons will be activated somehow, a little bit, subconsciously, maybe subthreshold, which corresponds subconsciously. And so that whole, I experience, a subject I experience as meaning. That, that's all what I mean by red. Red is a meaningful stimulus to me, as it is to you.